The next speaker is another one of our authors. We have some really good authors. And I told you on the first day, that's why we created this conference five years ago, was to showcase our authors. So they're all getting good exposure. Okay, the next author is Sherry Cortland. And her book is Windows of Opportunity. And we have, all of our authors come from very diverse backgrounds. And Sherry comes from the corporate world. So sometimes in their real life, what do you want to call their real life? They wouldn't want people to know they're involved in these kind of things. <laughs> well, tomorrow we've got a trial lawyer is one of our authors. So, you know, they probably have to leave two lives. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but Sherry Cortland wrote the book Windows of Opportunity. And it's about the things in your life that sometimes you think are negative bad experiences, and sometimes they're really not when you look at them from a different direction, different perspective. Okay, I'm going to let her tell you everything about it. Sherry Cortland. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. Okay. Thank you so much, Dolores, for having me here today. Thank you guys for coming in to hear my talk. I'm so excited to be here. The energy in this room is absolutely amazing. Do you guys feel it? Can you feel it? It is. We you know, last fall, Dolores published my first book, Windows of Opportunity, and much of that book was channeled by my guide group through automatic writing. How many of you are familiar with automatic writing? Great, I'm in the right place, okay. So automatic writing, as most of you know, is just one of the ways that spirit can communicate with us or through us, and it's so easy to do. It's very easy to do because you just kind of sit there and they do all the work. They're working through you. And the guide group that I often refer to as the GG, who worked on Windows of Opportunity, they came together specifically for the purpose of dictating this book. And the group consisted of kind of an interesting mix of spirit. There was Jeremy, who is one of my main guides for this lifetime, another entity named Alexio Porath, who has kind of popped in and out for the last two decades with different information for me. And then, rounding out this group, my Aunt Gracie, my cousin Linda, and my grandmother, all who currently live on the other side of the veil. Now, my grandmother took on the role of spokes guide for this project, and just like when she was on the other side of the veil, there was really no getting away with anything. And I think they brought her on board just to keep me in line. I'm pretty sure that's why she was there. Make sure I did what I was told. And automatic writing, as we just said, very, very easy. Spirit writes through you. And because you're fully conscious while you're doing it, you can ask questions about the information as it's coming through to you. It's like having a back and forth conversation, except instead of speaking, you're writing the words down. That's really the only difference. And when I'm working on the computer, which is mostly how I do my automatic writing these days, it reminds me of being in a chat room. It's that easy. It's that simple. And the best thing about automatic writing, in my opinion, besides the fact that everybody in here can do it if they want to, there's nothing special about me, the best thing to me is that you have a written record of everything that comes through. So no straining the brain trying to remember everything that you get, all the good stuff that comes through. And Windows of Opportunity was channeled by the GG, by my guide group, with two very specific goals in mind. First of all, to help us expedite our spiritual growth, and secondly, to help us finish our karmic to-do list for this lifetime with less pain and less drama. And in the book, the GG, they're very clear about wanting us to understand what's happening in our lives now so that we can move past the difficult stuff faster and easier, so that we can accomplish more during our time here, and so that we can have more time to spend having some fun and enjoying our beautiful planet. Being incarnated is not all about work. It's about having fun, too. Well, the foundation for most of the how to expedite your spiritual growth advice that the GG give in the book, it revolves around two concepts, windows of opportunity and relationship villains. And because these two concepts are also at the root of what I have to share with you this morning, if it's okay with you, I'm going to start out with a little... Reader's Digest condensed version of Windows of Opportunity and Relationship Villains, what they're all about. 
And let me start with windows of opportunity. When we're on the other side of the veil and we're preparing and we're planning for our next incarnation, we have decisions to make. What karmic debts are we going to repay? What karmic debts are we going to receive payment for? What experiences for the growth of our soul do we want to have? These are decisions that we need to make. And we don't make these decisions alone. We have a planning committee, so to speak. We have our guides, we have our counselors, our future family members, our future friends. We all kind of gather together. Now, once the decisions are made regarding what lessons we want to learn, we then have to figure out the how. How are we going to learn these lessons? And that's when we get to work creating our windows of opportunity. Our windows are actually situations and experiences that we create and plan for ourselves in order to learn our chosen lessons. And we build or construct multiple windows of opportunity for each individual lesson. That way, if we do miss a window, we have more chances to learn that particular lesson. And that's nice to know, right? That sounds like good news. But there's a catch. See, you know it. You know there's a catch. All right. And the catch is this. Our windows become more difficult and more drama-filled as we miss one and we move on to the other. And that doesn't sound nice, but we plan them. We plan them this way because we really want to make sure that we eventually wake up and learn this lesson because that's what it's all about. Now, when it comes to windows, the Gigi likes to say that it's better and certainly easier to learn our lessons closer to the ground floor instead of all the way up in the penthouse. And learning to spot our windows, our windows of opportunity more quickly, that's one way that we can get through our lessons with less drama and less pain. Now, personally speaking, I've been window watching for a couple of years now, and I can tell you this. It gets easier and easier to spot them over time, easier as you go along. It's like a skill that you can develop over time. And a good sign that you've got an open window in front of you is if something that's going on in your life right now is a repeat of a similar situation that you've already lived through maybe once or twice or even three times in the past, kind of like a life script. And a life script, guys, a life script is actually a series of windows of opportunities where we didn't learn the lesson because we keep attracting similar circumstances to ourselves so that we eventually wake up and go through that window. So if the same type of situation keeps occurring in your life, that is a clear message that you should examine how you dealt with this type of situation in the past. And then you should change your behavior, and that's the hard part. But altering how you dealt with similar situations should enable you to go through that window and then stop the pattern from repeating in the future. Oh, well, here's some advice for you. If you need a little help spotting your life script, just ask your family and friends. They'll be happy to point them out for you. Mine does, anyway. Now, again, spotting windows, it's a skill that we can all learn. We can all learn it. And to start, we just have to be aware, first of all, that they exist, that we have windows of opportunity in our lives. And the next thing we do is to start to look for patterns, look for patterns in our lives. And as you become more aware of what's going on in your life, you'll start seeing these windows. You're going to see them at home. You're going to see them at work. You'll see them in your friendships. And of course, what a surprise this is, they are all over our romantic relationships. You know they're there. And I even had a great big window of opportunity at Albertson's Grocery Store of all places. They pop up everywhere. So the first thing we do, we're on the other side of the veil. We're getting ready to incarnate. We create a blueprint for what we want to learn. That's number one. And then we construct our windows, which are the how. The how of how are we going to accomplish those goals. The next thing that we have to do is we have to figure out who we're going to be here with. That's the next part of planning our incarnation. We are not here alone. We are not in this world alone. We are surrounded by entities that are here to help us accomplish our goals. And many of them were there at that planning table with us when we decided what it was we wanted to learn and accomplish during this lifetime. Now, those entities are here to help us, 
and we're here to help them too. And we do that by playing different roles. We play the roles of our mothers, our fathers, sisters, brothers, husbands, wives, coworkers, even strangers we pass on the street most of the time are not random things for us. And sometimes, sometimes these entities take on what the GG call the relationship villain role. Now, according to the GG, the people that annoy us, those who antagonize us, those that we just don't like for whatever reason or another, people who have caused us trouble in our lives, even people who have been the, at the root of tragedy in our lives, the GG says that those people are most likely our closest universal friends, entities who love us enough to play a villain role so that we can learn a lesson or have an experience that we very much want to have during this lifetime. Playing a villain role, it's something that entities do out of love and friendship for each other because it's always, always a sacrifice. It's very easy to play the good guy, but it's very hard to put on that black hat and play the role of the bad guy. Yet we need these so-called bad guys. We need them to help us learn and grow. Our windows are the how, right? They are the how, and our relationship villains are the catalyst for our various learning experiences. Now, the GGs say that as we begin to accept our role, oh, sorry about that, our role, I can't do that, our role in planning the good and the bad things that happen to us, like car accidents, for example, we'll be that much more awake when it comes to being on the lookout for our windows of opportunity. Taking responsibility for what happens to us will also help us expedite our spiritual growth because we'll be able to forgive ourselves and we'll be able to forgive others faster, and that will enable us to move forward more quickly as well. Now, there's a lot more about windows of opportunity and relationship villains in the book, but now you've got the cliff notes. You've got the cliff notes, and so now we can get to what we're here to talk about today. And today I want to talk about facing our fears, because nothing keeps us from moving forward, from growing, and from evolving like a good old-fashioned dose of fear. No one is exempt from fear. And while this might sound a little bit crazy, it's true. I was once afraid to have my book published. I was afraid to write the book. I was afraid to have it published. And I know most people are happy when their books are published, right? They celebrate. But I wasn't. I was really scared. I was anxious about what my friends and family were going to say when they saw what it was about. I was especially terrified of what the people that I work with and for were going to say once they saw the subject matter. I would visualize people gathered around the water cooler. And guys, we don't even have water coolers where I work. Okay? But in my head, this is what I saw. I saw them gathered around this water cooler saying, have you heard about that Sherry Cortland? She believes in UFOs. She thinks that she talks to people who don't even have bodies. Well, <laughs> fear of being thought of as a weirdo kept me firmly, firmly locked in that New Age closet for a very long time. And because I stayed locked in that closet, I missed out on countless windows of opportunity for growth for myself. But when you write a book, you have to get out there and promote it. So I started to do a lot of radio shows, and of course, there are no secrets on Facebook, am I right? No. So it didn't take long for, work to, for word to get out at work about the book. So here's what finally happened to me. Here's what happened to me when I finally stepped out of that closet. Then about eight months now, I'm happy to report no one has called me in to write me up for my beliefs, and nobody has fired me yet for channeling spirit, so that's a good thing. But what has happened, though, is that a lot of my family, friends, and coworkers, they came out of the closet, too, because now they feel comfortable talking about these topics around that make-believe water cooler at work. So when it came to my book, I, I really had no choice. I would like to tell you that I stepped out of that closet on my own, but I didn't. I was forced out. I was forced out by my guide group because they were determined to have this book published. And I did everything that I could to drag my feet. I took the notes. I did do the notes, but I kept them in a drawer for a year before I turned them into book form. When I finished the manuscript, I kept that in the desk drawer for another year before I sent it off to Dolores to look at. Did everything I could. But now, 
I got to tell you, I'm glad. I'm so glad that the Gigi pushed and prodded me forward and made me face my fear because thanks to that book, I now do workshops about expediting spiritual growth. And that's led me to meet some of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. And I've made some great new friends. But most importantly, most importantly, and here's what I really want to share with you about my book experience because we're talking about overcoming fears here. When I came out, windows opened for me. Windows opened for me and lessons were learned. Because I overcame my fear of being thought of as weird, I was able to expedite my spiritual growth. And that's what happens, guys, when we face our fears. We learn, we grow, and we evolve. Now, now that I've brought up the subject of evolving, let me say this. As we learn, grow, and evolve, it's not just our own evolution that we're part of. Every time one of us learns a lesson, every time one of us grows spiritually, every time one of us raises our own personal vibration level, even just a tiny little bit, we affect each other and we affect our entire planet. We help raise each other's levels because we're all connected. This is no surprise to you, you know this. We're all connected and so as we progress individually and collectively, we're also helping to make the shift that much easier for everybody on planet Earth. And speaking of the shift, we all know that our planet is going through changes, right? We're at least knee deep, if not waist deep, already in the shift. The shift is a shift in consciousness, which in my opinion is a very good thing. But there is such a tremendous amount of fear surrounding the shift and the 2012 date. Fear of the shift in 2012, it's like a worldwide pastime now, am I right? Everybody's thinking about it and talking about it. And it's not hard to figure out why. We're living in the midst of war and conflict. We're continually dealing with the threat of terrorist activities. Our economy is in bad shape. All around us, our friends, our loved ones, they're going through difficult times. We might be going through difficult times ourselves. And there's no doubt that the challenging times that we're living in are just plain scary. They are. But here's something that the guide group wants us to remember, highlight, bold, underline, remember about this particular time in history. We signed up to be here now. We signed up for this. Not only did we sit down at that planning table and decide on our lessons and our growth experiences, but we chose to be here at this very time in history. We're here at this precise time on purpose. It is not an accident of birth. In fact, some would say, that we won the incarnation lottery when we were permitted to reincarnate at this particular time. Many souls wanted to be here now. All right, she, she knows, she bought that ticket. <laughs> Many wanted to be here, but not all were chosen. And I know, I know that with what we're going through personally and globally, some of us probably feel more like we were dragged here or drafted for this mission. And you know what? Some of us probably were. We probably were. But we all have one thing in, in common, and that's this. We agreed to be here now. And you know what? We have work to do. Light workers, and every one of you in this room is a light worker, agreed to be here now, agreed to be born at precisely the right time in order to be in position when needed. Who knows who the first big influx of light workers was during our most recent history? Anybody? Yes, absolutely, the 60s. It was the flower children of the 60s. They got things all stirred up with their peace demonstrations and all that make love, not war talk. They jump-started the shift in consciousness. And then those baby boomers, who we now know include a lot of reincarnated Atlanteans and Lemurians, and I'll get to that later, they stood on the backs of those so-called hippies, and they paved the way for the indigos, the crystals, and the rainbows who are collectively known as the what? The star children to be born. I know that Nikki Patillo, who is an expert on and wrote a very important book about star children, spoke right before me. So I know you guys are all up to speed on the star children, so I'm not going to go into that too heavily. But what I want to say is this. Regardless, regardless of what each group is called, they have a purpose. Each influx or generation of light workers brings a more evolved energy and a more evolved awareness to this planet. So why the influx of so many light workers to our little planet right now? Well, that is because the Earth is in the process of making universal history. 
our entire planet, along with its inhabitants, are shifting together. We're in the throes of it right now. Guys, this is not something that we are going to wake up to on the morning of December 21st, 2012. And I'll get to that in a little bit also. Now, according to my guide, to my guide Gilbert, human beings are evolving together into something more than we have ever been before. And our beloved planet Earth is evolving as well. Now, once the combined vibrational level of the human race and the vibrational level of the planet, once they converge at a predetermined frequency, and I do not know what that frequency is, but when that happens, the shift in consciousness will be complete. I think it's exciting. What do you think to be part of something so momentous? So momentous that beings from the far reaches of the universe are here vying for front row seats. But it's scary too. It's scary because a lot of the things that we're used to and familiar with are changing. And according to the GG, these changes are part of our progress. They're part of our evolution as human beings. And things are changing. I mean, there's no doubt about it, but they're changing even faster for light workers. Why? Because light workers are always, always on the front lines during times like this. It might not seem like it right this minute, but light workers, we light workers, thrive on overcoming adversity. We thrive on paving the way for great change to happen. Why else would we continually sign up for this kind of work, incarnation after incarnation? Did you think this was your first time on the battlefield of human evolution? No, 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 you've done this before. We've all done this before. For light workers, guys, the time is now. Now to wake up and follow that little voice within because that voice is what will guide us to where we need to be, to what it is that we're here to do. That voice within will help facilitate our progress and facilitate our evolution as we complete this shift. So let's talk about our mission. Some people are crystal clear about what their mission is. Others are still waiting to wake up to it. Or, 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 they might be smack dab in the middle of it, but don't realize it. Many of us are already fulfilling our role without recognizing what we're doing. And that's because we're being guided by our inner voice, our higher selves. And as you start to pay more attention to what's happening in your life right now, and you pay more attention to your inner voice, don't be surprised if that inner GPS guides you to simply bring in and hold the light in certain geographic areas which could mean, could mean that you're guided to move to a new town or to a new neighborhood, maybe change jobs, or, or to stay right where you are. You could already be in perfect position. Attracting and holding the light, that is the most important thing that each one of us can do. And many of us right now are feeling a little moved or guided to make some changes that will enable us to create and establish more and more pockets of light to assist the planet in the shift. Now, in addition to attracting and holding the light, which is the job of everyone here, every one of us in this room, your light worker contract, it might call for you to write a book, to lead workshops, to counsel people, to give readings, to do energy work, like Dolores to do hypnotherapy sessions, or more importantly, it might call for you to continually send out positive vibrations by being nice to and smiling at those around you. Being nice and smiling, I know you gotta be thinking, what, what is she saying here? But being nice and smiling, these are simple yet very, very powerful things, very powerful actions that every one of us can take at home, at work, and wherever we go during the course of our regular day. And they have a huge, huge impact. My guide Gilbert, he is very, very clear that holding the light, smiling, and sending out positive vibrations to those around us, these are essential and critical parts of our overall mission here on planet Earth. Now, I was on a radio show a few months ago and the host asked me, do I really believe that a simple smile has so much power? And the answer is yes. All capital letters, Y-E-S, yes. A smile is absolutely huge when it comes to raising our vibrations. 
Think about how you feel. Think how you feel when someone smiles at you. It feels great, doesn't it? It does. And when someone smiles at you, aren't you more likely to smile at the next person you see? We have to because smiles are just contagious. They just are. And what we feel, what we feel when we smile at each other, well, that's the feeling of our vibrational level being raised. It's true. Our vibrational levels will increase from just one little old smile. And as Gilbert says, every one of us is here to serve the light in our own way. And all parts of the mission are crucial. Gilbert also says, got to go easy on yourself if you feel like you're not sure what it is you're supposed to be doing. Go easy on yourself because your higher self is directing you whether you're aware of it or not. And also, and this is something to keep in mind, it's much more challenging for us to get our bearings once we're on this side of the veil as we strive to wake up while having to deal with everyday life. Everyday life is hard. Plus, when we're on the other side making our life plans, we're wide awake over there. You know, we're wide awake. We know all the bumps and bruises that we're going to encounter. We know the grand plan. And we know why we have to experience those bumps and bruises. We know that they are key to our spiritual growth. And there's something else that we have to deal with on this side that we never have to deal with when we're on the other side of the veil. And that is an extremely strong negative vibration called fear. And fear can affect the grand plan that we set into motion for ourselves if we let it. You know, even the most experienced and decorated of light workers has trouble facing the astonishing amount of fear that currently exists on planet Earth. And fear is a fact of life for us, but we can do something about it. We can extinguish it, just like we can extinguish a campfire if we make the choice to do so. And when we do make that choice, we help accelerate our spiritual growth. We can deal with our fears or we can let them control us. It's a conscious choice that each one of us makes. But the decision to face our fears, well, that decision, that is a massive step forward for us when it comes to taking control of our lives, expediting our spiritual growth, raising our vibrations, and keeping our feet firmly planted on the evolutionary highway. Part of evolving is recognizing our fear and then dealing with it. Now, I think that one of the reasons fear is able to take hold of us the way it does, and this has certainly been the case for me anyway, is that the majority of us try to avoid what we fear instead of facing it head on. And you know, the universe gives us whatever it is we focus on, right? So it should, come to, it should come as no surprise that we can, and really, we must train ourselves to start to focus on the things that we truly want, not on the stuff that we don't want in our lives. But it can be tricky. This can be tricky because the tricky thing about fear is that by trying to avoid what we fear, we can actually end up spending a lot of time thinking about that exact thing. You follow me? Right, so when we try to avoid it, we end up focusing on it, and then what happens? We give it life. We give it more life. And it's one of those vicious little cycles that you hear about, but you know what? It's a cycle that we can break. So let's talk about the universe giving us what we want for just a minute. We all know that we can communicate with the universe. We communicate with the universe through what? Our words and our thoughts, right? Okay, so it follows then, that whatever we dwell on or whatever we focus on, the universe interprets as a message from us that this is what we want in our lives. And the universe gives it to us. And they give us lots of it because the universe is very generous this way. Which is why we, especially light workers, have to be exceptionally and exceedingly careful about what we put out into the universe. For example, we could say we don't want to lose our jobs and then think about nothing else but losing our jobs. And what do you think the universe will make happen for us? We'll all be filing for unemployment insurance together. That's what will happen because that's what the universe will think that we want. I read a book recently uh, by an author named Mary Soliel, and it's called I Can See Clearly Now. Mary says, when we allow ourselves to get trapped into fear and we focus on it, we can actually attract and thus create synchronicity 
that reflects that fear, which is a fancy schmancy way of saying what you think you're going to get, what you focus on you're going to get. My guides are in total agreement with Mary's statement. They are very clear that if we focus on something that we're afraid of, the universe will bring us more of whatever that happens to be because that is the way of the universe. Now this reminder about our words and our thoughts is especially important now because according to my guide group, our thoughts and our words are becoming more and more powerful every single day. And how is this happening? We're making it happen. It's because of us. Because we've raised our vibrational level and the frequency of the planet to the point where we now have to pay attention to and watch what we think. As human beings become more powerful, what we think about becomes more important than what we actually say. This is because what we think about is a truer representation of our actual feelings, our wants, and our desires. What we think about, that is what we're going to get. What we think about is what we're going to draw to ourselves. We can say one thing out loud, but be thinking another. What do you think we're going to end up with? It's what we're thinking about that we're going to end up with. The thoughts of human beings are that powerful. You are that powerful. Now imagine how powerful we are together, and then you'll understand how groups like the baby boomers, the flower children, the indigos, etc., how they can affect such great change for the human race. Now bringing this back around to our discussion of fear, recognize your power, acknowledge the powerful being that you are, and then use that power to overcome your fears and expedite your spiritual growth. We all have the power to transmute fear, which again is just a form of negative energy. We can transmute it into positive energy. And we do this by facing our fears and then letting them go. We've got to let them go. Now, an interesting thing about fear is that it comes in all shapes and sizes. And what might scare the pants off one person might seem very silly to another. But that doesn't make that little thing any less scary to the person experiencing that fear. For example, all right, this is a little embarrassing for me, but I'm just going to tell you anyway. Last year, I overcame a fear of, of all things, Facebook. Facebook. I didn't understand it. I didn't want anything to do with it. I didn't want to do it. But I had to get on Facebook to start to promote my book. So fortunately, a good friend of mine helped me. She did my page for me. And I, I became accustomed to it. And I started to work with it. And it it was okay, it was okay. Today, I am proud to tell you, I have 252 Facebook friends. So, <laughs> right? So, being afraid of Facebook, it was silly, it was silly. It's good for a laugh now, but it was scary to me at first. Now, I also overcame another little fear last year that might actually elicit some compassion from you guys. My niece, who lives with me, got her learner's permit. I was afraid to get in the car with her. She was scary. She drove way too fast. She took those corners. I don't know what. I was really scared. But now, now she's got her license. And you know what? She runs errands for me. <laughs> Yay. So that worked out pretty well for me, too. And you already know, once upon a time, I was afraid to publish my book was afraid to come out of that new age closet. But you know what? Only great things have happened to me because I faced that fear and did that. I was really more pushed on that one. Everybody here has similar stories, right? We've all faced and we've all overcome varying degrees of fear at one time or another. And that's something that we need to keep on doing because, because, because every time that we face and overcome a fear, no matter how big or how small it is, we are opening up windows of opportunity for ourselves to accelerate our spiritual growth and to raise our vibrations. And keep this in mind, too. Fear can be a lot like the common cold. If we're not careful, we can very easily pick up someone else's fears, internalize them, get stuck with them ourselves, and then pass them on to others. Right? We don't want to be typhoid Mary when it comes to fear. So be careful. Don't allow yourself to get bogged down listening to others who just simply revel in their fears. And there are people like that. Some have been afraid for so long. Their fear is so familiar to them, so habitual, so comfortable. They don't really want to make any changes. They just like to talk about it. They like to talk about what they're afraid of. 
but talking about it won't help overcome it. We have to take action. Just talking about it will bring more of the same. We all have the muscle, we all have the clout to face and overcome our fears. Let me share with you a four-step plan that the Gigi gave me for overcoming fear. Number one, define exactly what it is that you're afraid of. Define what you're afraid of. We have to first identify exactly what it is in order to counteract it or to neutralize it. Number two, once you know exactly what you're afraid of, acknowledge it, recognize it, and then release it. Let it go. The letting go is the action that will neutralize the fear. Number three, if you have trouble at all letting go, and believe me, this happens to me every time I try to face something down, meditate. Meditate on how to neutralize your fear. And now, here comes the hard part. You've got to listen and pay attention to what that little voice is saying to you, okay? That little voice, remember, is your higher self. The part of us that's not incarnated, the part of us that can still see the big picture and the purpose for this incarnation, that little voice is therefore in the catbird seat when it comes to giving us guidance. But a lot of us don't pay a whole lot of attention to that little voice. That's something else that's a skill that we can train ourselves on. And fourth, and lastly, visualize yourself free from that fear. Ask yourself this, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And picture yourself doing it. Visualization is putting your thoughts into action. And taking action is how we handle fear. Face it, neutralize it, and then move on. That's how light workers keep fear from blocking the light. That's how we increase our vibrational levels. And that is how we evolve. Now, got to take a drink here. All right. Speaking once again of evolving, let's talk a little bit more about this shift. <clears throat> I'd like to read you some of what Gilbert dictated about the shift. He said, from this side of the veil, it is considered great good luck to be part of such a momentous historic time period because it is like no other in recent history. It is of epic proportions like the Atlantis disasters before. When a civilization undergoes such changes as you are about to undergo, it is a time for great rejoicing because it heralds a change in the vibrational level of the planet. Sometimes such a change is a going backward to start again and try to get it right the next time. Sometimes, like now, it is a going forward, a great movement forward that will help the human race progress. And in this case, you are progressing like you never have before. An entire race of beings, not just one small group, will move forward. An entire planet will move forward. And the universe watches. And the universe waits. This is truly an historic occasion. And how can this be happening? It happens on the backs of, or rather the souls of, all those who came before and all those who are incarnated right now making it happen. It happens one soul and one being at a time. Because without individuals working and helping to bring the light to the planet, none of this would be happening right now. What Gilbert wants us to know here is that there's more to this lifetime for us than just taking care of our karmic debt, learning lessons, and having life experiences. Every one of us, we are part of something that's much bigger than ourselves. We are part of this great happening, this great shift in consciousness. The more light we bring to the planet, the more negative energy we transmute into positive energy, and the more positive energy that we release into the atmosphere, the easier the shift will be to complete. Now this information was channeled by Gilbert so that we can understand and appreciate the fact that each one of us, each and every one of us, is vitally important to the overall mission. We're all very important here. What we do individually does matter. What we do as a group will change the human race. Now, in talking about the shift, I have to touch on 2012. I've got to tell you up front, I am not a 2012 expert, okay? 
but I have been to countless workshops on the subject. I've read everything I can get my hands on about it, and my guides have dictated a good bit about it also. Now, based on my research and what's been given to me through automatic writing, here is my advice when it comes to 2012. Are you ready? All right. Do not go to Vegas and bet the retirement fund. Don't do that. And do not take your kids' college money and go out on a shopping spree. You're going to need that money. And I have what I think are very good reasons for this advice, starting with something that Gilbert dictated just this past January. Let me read it to you. He said, Sherry, we know you are caught up in this 2012 hoopla, and we ask that you let everyone know that 2012 will come and go, but the shift will end in its own time. And it is the completion of the shift that we are talking about here, as the planet is already experiencing changes. More changes will come. We know you will find this hard to understand, but this is a very exciting time to be alive on planet Earth. This is an exciting time for the universe, as representatives from many planets gather to watch history being made. We know you want more information on 2012, and all we can tell you is that 2012 is a date on the calendar. There is no way to know with certainty when the shift will be complete. We can tell you that the human race has stepped up greatly in the last decades, and because of that, things will not happen as was once predicted. Such is the power of every individual currently incarnated on the planet, and the vibrations of the planet and its inhabitants are about to undergo a great amplification in vibrational levels. The increases that will take place over the next three years will be greater than those of the last three decades combined. Okay. Well, nothing like being taken to task by your guide group, but you know what? Gilbert is right. He's right about me. I am caught up in all the 2012 hoopla. I cannot help myself. Do you know that there are 2012 countdown calendars online? There are. And you know, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, the shift was something only the New Age and metaphysical communities were talking about. But now, now there's a disaster movie called 2012, documentaries all over TV, and you know what? There was even an article about 2012 in Playboy magazine earlier this year. How much more mainstream can you go? The shift has gone mainstream, and its new name is 2012. And you know, I think it's hard not to get caught up in all this 2012 stuff, especially if you watch the nightly news or you read the newspapers. It's easy, easy to visualize the four horsemen of the apocalypse, war, famine, death, and pestilence, coming around the corner with an ETA of December 21st, 2012. So let's examine that 2012 date. Let's talk about that 2012 date. I think we can all agree that the Mayans ended their calendar on 2012, yes? That's not really in question. But who, tell me who decided that that meant that it was going to be the end of the world. That's what I want to know. Lee Carroll, who channels the entity Cryon, he's been to the Mayan ruins. He spent a lot of time investigating the 2012 predictions. And in January 2009, he published an article about 2012 that he called the Doom Factory. You can read the whole thing in its entirety online. But there are two points that he brought up in the article, both of which made so much sense to me that I just wanted to share them with you guys today. Number one, nothing sells advertising space like the oncoming destruction of our planet. 2012 makes for great copy. It's great reading. It's great for movie ticket sales. And most of us have known about the shift for decades, yes? But it's gone mainstream now. Why? Because we're so much closer to the date. And again, disaster sells. 2012 is a huge moneymaker. Scaring the pantyhose off of us sells newspapers. It sells magazines. And it sells commercial time on TV. People are getting rich from the idea that 2012 is the end of the world. Second thing that he had in there that caught my eye was this. The Mayans, the Egyptians, the Hopi, the Aztecs, the Toltecs, the Druids, and the Incas all have predicted a great shift. None of them predicted the end of the world. But for some reason, possibly, possibly because the Mayans ended their calendar on 12-21-2012, 
the great shift is now being interpreted as the end. When this happened, I don't know. I don't know when this happened, but I do know this. Lee Carroll was not alone at the Mayan pyramids. He was with a guy named George Baez. George Baez wrote a book about 2012, but more importantly, George Baez can read and translate Mayan hieroglyphics. So he was a good guy to be there with. So together, Carol and Baez looked at the glyphs on the walls of the Mayan pyramids, and here's what they found. The Mayans did not write about the world coming to an end. They did, however, write about a great shift. They did write about energy cycles. And they did write that one of the highest vibrations that the Earth had ever seen would return and be amplified. And that would happen at the time of the galactic alignment, which they predicted for 2012. Now, I'm not a scientist. I am not an astronomer. And you probably all understand the galactic alignment far better than I do. All I can say for myself is thank goodness for the internet so I can look this stuff up. And when I looked it up, here's what I found. The galactic alignment is the alignment of the December solstice sun with the galactic equator. Hence the December 21st date. Think fall equinox here. The galactic equator is the midpoint of the Milky Way galaxy. If you picture the Milky Way galaxy as a great big disk, then the, the galactic equator is at the halfway point between the top and the bottom of that disk. And there's another thing that comes into the picture here. It's called the solstice point. The solstice point is the precise center point of the body of the sun as viewed from the Earth. Now that we've got all this scientific jargon in our heads, let me repeat what the Mayan glyphs said. They said that a very high vibration would return and be amplified at the time of the galactic alignment, which they predicted for 2012. Again, nowhere on those pyramid walls did it say that the world was going to end when those two things happened simultaneously. And now comes the really interesting part of what Lee Carroll discovered. Lee Carroll says, and so do many others, that the 2012 alignment predicted by the Mayans was off by about 5.5 degrees. And are you ready for this? It's already happened. It's already happened. This is due to an error that the Mayans had in their calculations. But you know what? Give them a break. Being off by only 5.5 degrees, I mean, back then with what they had to work with, that's not so bad. Well, Carol and the other 2012 researchers, they say that according to our scientists, working with our technology today, that the precise alignment of the solstice point with the galactic equator was calculated to have occurred in 1998. So that would mean that the galactic alignment took place 12 years ago. And look at us, we're all still here. We're all still here, right? And this correlates with what Gilbert said about us already being in the shift, and that it's the culmination of the shift that we're all working towards. Now again, exactly when that's going to take place, nobody knows. That can't be predicted. But what we do know, though, is that this shift is a shift in consciousness, which means that the human race is going up another rung on the evolutionary ladder. It's a time for celebration, not a time for fear. And by the way, according to Lee Carroll, the Mayans made predictions, he saw them on the walls, that went beyond 2012. Good news, right? So when it comes to why the Mayans ended their calendar on that particular date, there's an astronomer named Philip Platt, or Platt. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it. I'm going to say Platt. Philip Platt has a theory that I want to share with you. Platt says that the Mayan calendar is like a car odometer, and that the December 21st, 2012 date, that's the point where it would click over to a new cycle kind of like a car odometer clicks back to zeros after it hits all the nines. I like that theory personally. I don't know what you guys think about it, but I like it. Now, with regard to the shift in 2012, here's what I think we should be focusing our attention on. Let's focus on the fact that we're evolving. We're evolving into something more than we have ever been at any time in human history. And according to Gilbert, we will surpass even Atlantis. 
Sounds impossible, doesn't it, to think that we might surpass Atlantis. But earlier I mentioned to you that baby boomers are reincarnated Atlanteans. This is something that my guide group continually says to me over and over and over during automatic writing sessions, and many, many others have written about this too. In fact, on the subject of Atlantis, British historian H.G. Wells once wrote, he wrote, there is magic in names, and the mightiest among these words of magic is Atlantis. It is as if this vision of a lost culture touches the most hidden thoughts of our soul. I, have, I agree with him because who isn't intrigued by the thought of Atlantis? I know I am. I read everything I can get my hands on about Atlantis. Atlantis in 2012. If you're talking about it, I'm there. And maybe, maybe we're so intrigued by Atlantis because we remember it. Maybe we remember it on a soul level. Reincarnation makes it so that we are our own ancestors, right? The Atlantean civilization is back in full force. They're back to try to get it right this time. We are trying to get it right this time. Now, depending on what books you're reading, there were either two or three great periods of destruction in Atlantis. What all agree on, though, is that Atlantis eventually did itself in completely because of a severe misuse of power and a severe misuse of technology. They had weapons of mass destruction. They misused them. They bullied other civilizations. Does any of this sound familiar? Just a little bit, right? Well, we know that Atlantis eventually shrunk from a continent to a series of islands, and then it was gone. But prior to that final destruction, though, there was enough time, enough warning for the people of Atlantis to exit if they wanted to. And according to Edgar Cayce, some went to Egypt, some went to South America, some even went to Arizona. And get this, Edgar Cayce says that some went to the Yucatan land of the Mayan experiences. Maybe it's possible that the very people who wrote the shift prophecies were the displaced Atlanteans or their ancestors. Could be. Anyone who watches the History Channel knows that bits and pieces of what researchers believe to be Atlantis have been found different cultures all over the world, right? All over the world we found this, this evidence. And of course, Plato wrote about Atlantis as an advanced civilization back in 360 BC. Now that makes sense to me. The technology of the Atlanteans was no doubt developed to a point that was well beyond the comprehension of mankind during Plato's time. But why do we, why do we think that the Atlanteans were so advanced? Our cars, our planes, our cell phones, TVs, microwaves, my favorite invention of all time, the DVR, which I can now not live without, these things would be beyond the comprehension of the aboriginal people of the Australian outback today, wouldn't they? I think it's very much a matter of perspective when it comes to declaring a, civil a civilization to be advanced or not advanced. And no doubt that the Atlanteans brought the human race to a higher technological level than had ever been achieved previously. And according to the GG, it was thought that the evolution that we're part of right now, the shift in consciousness that we're part of right now, it was thought that this would have taken place during Atlantean times. But it didn't. It didn't happen then because their level of spirituality did not match their level of technology. And that's the point of this experiment, this mission. It's why the Atlanteans are back in full force and why the lightworker groups are here. To do it again, to get it right, to attain a level of spirituality that matches our advanced level of technology so that we can finally take the next step up the evolutionary ladder. While I was doing some research on Atlantis, I found a little tidbit that I thought you might find interesting. Actually, it's kind of surprising. Many Atlanteans were pro-slavery, and this was the basis for great political upheaval within their culture. According to Edgar Cayce's case readings in the book Edgar Cayce on Atlantis, the Atlanteans had a slave labor force. There was a faction of the population who didn't think this was right, and they wanted change. Frank Alper wrote a three-book series on Atlantis. He also talks about a slave labor force, and he refers to them as things, and he describes the type of work that they were forced to do. 
both Casey and Alper indicate that slaves were bred in Atlantis. Isn't it interesting that the issue of slavery was played out here in the United States just 125 years ago? I mean, that's the blink of the universal eye, 125 years. And what happened? We had our own civil war. We had the eventual outlawing of slavery after a five-year-long war that destroyed many of our own precious cities, yes? Is the city of Atlanta named Atlanta by coincidence, especially considering its role in the Civil War? Is it possible that that particular time in our history was essentially a large group karmic learning experience for some former Atlanteans? Once you get started, it is not hard to find similarities between Atlantis and the United States of America. In fact, in Windows of Opportunity, the book, the GG dictated that during the final destruction of Atlantis, there were two factions fighting against each other. One side wanted to use their massive weapons, technology, and power to bully and control their own civilization as well as the rest of the civilizations on the planet. The other side wanted to control the weapons and they wanted to promote global peace. Back in 1984, Charles Berlitz wrote the following in his book, Atlantis, the Eighth Continent. He said, the legend of Atlantis, now becoming a recognizable reality, is of importance to our modern world. Less than half a century ago, it would have seemed incredible that mankind would have been able effectively to destroy the human race and perhaps the planet itself. It seems as though Atlantis is increasingly thought of more as fact than fiction, and that important writers and thinkers are now making the connection between Atlantis and the United States. Nearly three decades ago, Berlitz recognized that we could conceivably destroy our own civilization and destroy the planet too, just like Atlantis. Again, the more you read about Atlantis, the more the correlations between Atlantis and the United States become apparent. We've once again attained an incredible level of technology, we have weapons of mass destruction, and we are more than capable of destroying our own world. And we know how that final political battle turned out in Atlantis, and that's why the Atlanteans are here now, during the largest group karma experiment ever undertaken. More Atlanteans than ever before have reincarnated at the same time to see if, as a group, they can make the correct decisions this time around. I think the Civil War was a practice run for this. Now indulge me for one minute, I'm gonna share one more bit of political channeling with you. In Windows of Opportunity, the guide group wrote that Bush, Gore, and Obama were all Atlanteans, Atlanteans at the time of the Great Destruction, and that then, like now, Bush was on the opposite side, the opposite side of the fence from Gore and Obama. They also wrote that Bush has done a great job this time around of calling attention to the negative effects of bullying and the negative effects of violence as a means of achieving peace. It doesn't work. Think relationship villain here. We have political relationship villains just like we have them in our lives. And here's a little something that the GG dictated right after the last presidential election. They said, with this election of Obama, you, the United States, have opened the door to a great light shining down on this planet. And with that door open, and with England, France, and the rest of Europe already on board, with Australia ready to go, you will begin to see the rest of the planet opening up to the light, because indeed, there are so many pockets of light in other countries and continents that it will not be long before the light is in the majority and the shift will be complete. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the midst of the most magnificent creation opportunity of all of our lifetimes put together. Isn't it cool to know that our hard work is paying off here? It is, right? Now, I know that my time is more than up, so let me just leave you with the following. Remember who you are. Remember how powerful you are. Expedite your spiritual growth by watching for your windows of opportunity and by facing fear head on. Don't forget to watch those words and especially those thoughts. Listen to that little voice within and smile. Smile as together we take a huge step up the evolutionary ladder. Thank you so much for being here today. How'd I do? <laughs> Pay on time? Ah, 
I have 10 minutes to spare. Yes, I did you okay. changed your mind. I did okay. Because you said you wanted 15 more minutes. I told you that I was going to try and get it done in an hour and five, and I did. Okay. You said till a quarter two. Do you want to take questions? Yes, so we can do questions. Okay. Sure. You want to take some questions? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The one thing you didn't really focus on were the relationship villains and the windows of opportunity. Well, no, because that's in the book, and I wanted to talk okay. about fear. Last year, I talked a lot about relationship villains and windows of opportunity. Okay, kind of wanted you know, to take about it a step the further. In their lives that they think are negative. Okay, but does anybody have any questions? If not, she's going to be over here doing a book signing, and you can talk to her the whole time she's here then. Okay. Come over and talk to me. I'd love to answer your questions individually. I'll just be in the room right next okay. door. And we're going to break to 1 o'clock. We'll be back. We're having lunch, and 1 o'clock we'll all be back here then. Okay. <laughs>